my name is Elaine McDonald, and this is my project, Towards Fabrication and Characterization of Transitional Metal Dicalcogenide Based Van der Waal Heterostructures for Flexible Electronics. Um, my mentors are Wei Li and Marie Piyapish, and I'm under Dr. Arkham So just a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today, the motivation behind our project, a little introduction to what TMDs and heterostructures really are, how to fabricate them, how to characterize them, and what we're going to do with them in the future. So the motivation behind our project is the hot topic of flexible electronics because they have amazing applications. Um, over here you can see a flexible phone. If you drop that out of a four-story window, it can bounce back. Maybe you can make uh, flexible electronics light enough to put on clothing and then have soldiers carry them into the battlefield. Or e-tattoos where you can alert your doctor to abnormalities without you even knowing that they're going on. So a lot of cool stuff. Um, so we're looking for a material that is able to be flexible enough for that. Silicon is too brittle. So right now we're working on TMDs. Um, they consist of one transitional metal atom and two calcogen atoms. And when they're in monolayer, they're actually semiconductors, which is good for mobility, current saturation, on-off ratio, RF performance, they're photosensitive. They're really ideal for flexible electronics. However, we don't have the exact properties that we're looking for, so we are moving on to heterostructures. Heterostructures are vertically stacked TMDs, and they're just held together by van der Waal forces, which means that they're simple to fabricate, there's no lattice matching. And um, if you look over here, you can see that we have an MOS2 and a WSE2 flake, and this is the band gap for MOS2, and this is the band gap for WSE2. And then when you create your uh, heterostructure, you actually create a new band gap, and this is what we're able to manipulate in order to create high mobility, a better on-off ratio, lower power electronics, you can even create LEDs and lasers and terahertz and infrared and visible spectrum. There's a lot of things that are possible once you create these heterostructures. Flexible substrates. So how do we fabricate these heterostructures? First, we have mechanical exfoliation to create the monolayer of the TMDs. And then we have two different methods of fabricating the actual heterostructure, and that's the micromanipulator and the pick and place. So mechanical exfoliation. All right. You place a little bit of your bulk TMD in the middle of blue tape, and you tape it, and you simply separate it layer by layer, since it's held interlayerly by van der Waal forces, until you have lots of flakes all over your blue tape. And then once you've done that, you can't see when you've achieved monolayer, it's too small, but um, once you think you have, you can place your tape onto the gel pack, and this gel pack is used in order to create a larger area flake and to reduce the tape residue that's left on there. Um, so once you've placed your tape onto the gel pack and you think that you've placed flakes onto the gel pack, you can then transfer it to your silicon silicon oxide wafer, which you just place your silicon silicon oxide wafer on the gel pack, tap the corners, and remove it with tweezers. Here's an image of a flake on your silicon silicon oxide wafer. Okay, so then once you've achieved monolayer with your flakes, um, for the micronipulator, it's a simple process. There's no chemicals involved, no temperature change. You simply exfoliate your MOSE2 on your silicon silicon oxide wafer, your WSE2 on PDMS. And the PDMS is important because for the micromanipulator, you use a strong tungsten tip and you go underneath your WSE2 flake on your PDMS, which you can see over there, um, pick it up, and then you move it and place it on top of your MOSE2 flake. There are a few challenges with this uh, method. If your WSE2 is exfoliated onto PDMS, it's difficult to characterize it. You can't tell if it's monolayer um, because you can't use certain machines like the Raman and the photoluminescence test. Um, as well as if it is monolayer, the tungsten tip sometimes is too sharp and will rip your flake. So there are a few challenges, but we've been working on optimizing this. So characterization, making sure that you have your monolayer, making sure you have that characterization. Um, first, we go into the optical microscope. And this is important because you're actually able to see an optical contrast between different flake thicknesses. So if your flake is really bright, it's probably too thick, it's not monolayer. So first we go under the optical microscope, kind of check it out, see what we have on our silicon silicon oxide wafers. Then we go under the atomic force microscope, and we do this to test the vertical thickness of the flakes. Uh, monolayer is normally around 0.9 nanometers, so if you have around that, you probably have monolayer. Next we go under the Raman spectroscopy and photoluminescence test, and we do this to fingerprint our material, make sure we have the right amount of layers, the right material under the Raman using the vibrations that it gives off to us. And the photoluminescence is used to test the band gap because 
like I said earlier, if you have a monolayer, you have a direct VN gap. Next, we go into the microwave impedance microscopy, and this is used to test the conductivity and permittivity of the sample, and um, this is important for our header structure, getting those characteristics that we want. And finally, um, we've also been using the scanning electron microscope, and that's to test the morphology of the sample, make sure it's as flat and smooth as possible to create that header structure. However, this isn't recommended all the time because it could burn your sample. Okay, so here, MOIC2. We have our optical image right here. Um, if you can, here, okay. <laughs> you can see the bright blue parts, those are too thick. Then you have like the darker purple parts that's still too thick. The shadowy area, that's a monolayer because it's just so thin, you can tell immediately with the optical. Then we took it to AFM to test the vertical thickness, 1.2 nanometers, close to 0.9. Believe we have monolayer. Put under the SEM, smooth, looks like a plate we can use for head out structure. And then we put it under the MIM. And you can see here, this is where the monolayer part should be. But it's difficult to see because it's not as conductive as the bilayer and trilayer parts right here. Okay, this is MOSC2 under our Raman spectroscopy. Um, we have two peaks that we're interested in. We have the A1G peak and the E2G peak. A1G peak is in charge of telling us the vibrational um, relations in the vertical direction, and this is in charge of the horizontal direction. You can see, we can characterize what kind of flake we have based on whether it matches the one layer, two layer, three layer characterizations. Here we have it under our photoluminescence test. Uh, a band gap for a monolayer is 1.34, and so right here, it comes out to be about 1.56 uh, energy, but that's because of the binding energy that's added in addition to our direct band gap energy. Same goes for WSE2. We have our optical image right here, AFM. This ended up being a bilayer because it has 2 nanometers in vertical thickness, and you can see it's a little bit darker than the last model layer image. Um, SEM looks great, smooth, and MIM still not very bright because it's still a very thin flake. Okay, here we have the Raman spectrum of our SWSE2. You can see our A1G peak and our E2G peak right here. And then here we have our photoluminescence test. You can see that this is the monolayer, has the direct band gap right here at 1.67. And over here you can see that uh, the direct band gap is 1.25 plus the binding energy that leads it to that energy level. Okay, the cool part, our hetero structure. So, this is created using the pick and place. We have right here our WSC2 flake and our MOSC2 flake. And right where this overlaps is our hetero structure. So you can see here, we have our MOSC2 flake. It's a little thin. You can see that it has like that shadow characteristic. And then we have our WSC2 flake, the bilayer, a little thicker. And then right here in this white area, within the white border, you can see that's the hetero structure. Looking at it under the AFM, 1.6 or 0.6 nanometers. That's the monolayer of MLIC2, and 2.5 being the header structure right there. So we're excited, we have it fully contacted. SEM, smooth, as good as we can get it. And MIM, you can see that once you created the header structure, the conductivity levels go up significantly, much brighter, which we're very excited about. Okay, here's our header structure underneath our Raman spectrum. You can see our MLIC2 flake is uh, coming up at a peak right about 238 and our WSC2 flake about right by 244. And our header structure actually has two peaks under the Raman spectroscopy machine. And we have a small one right where the MOSC2 should be and a bigger one at WSC2. It's bigger for the WSC2 because it was the bilayer flake. Next, we have our photoluminescence test. And what you end up seeing here, first we have our MOSC2 peak, our WSC2 peak. For MOSC2 and WSC2 header structure, we have their band gap right here, but we also have an additional band gap peak right here. And this is because of the exciton that is created once you create that header structure. The electron and the hole, from the electron from the MYC2 and the hole from the WC2 create this exciton, which give it that extra band gap, which we're using to manipulate to create band gap engineering, create those properties. So in conclusion, we successfully fabricated and characterized our TMBs to monolayer. We successfully fabricated and characterized our header structure and we used it with the pick and place tool. We optimized gel pack exfoliation and we tried to get as large area as possible, getting it to monolayer. And we optimized that micromanipulator process for the header structure fabrication. So in the future, we're looking forward to fabricating and characterizing more on flexible substrates. We're looking forward to creating gate contacts on header structures for additional gate tuning. 
and we're looking forward to fabricating plasmonic antennas on van der Waal heterostructures for enhancing light coupling. So, I'd like to acknowledge these people for helping us out, for Nascent, for giving me this opportunity to come here, and for the MRC for giving us a clean room.